The U.S. Federal Reserve was in a difficult position during the Great Recession. By the end of 2008, it had already pushed the federal funds rate to its zero lower bound in hopes of kickstarting an economic recovery. I covered this impact in the last episode. But even this dramatic cut wasn't enough. The economy was still suffering with millions unemployed and businesses on the brink of bankruptcy. So to help stimulate the economy, the Fed turned to two unconventional and controversial policies called forward guidance and quantitative easing. In this episode, I will examine the research on whether these policies help the economy recover. During the Great Recession, the Fed used its forward guidance to publicly commit to keeping the federal funds rate at its zero lower bound for a substantial amount of time. Actually, the commitment was even bolder than that. The Fed committed to keeping the Fed funds rate at zero even after the economy had started to recover. Quantitative easing was a series of programs through which the Fed bought over $3 trillion of long-term financial securities from private investors. Securities like treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. These purchases represented a massive expansion of the Fed's balance sheet. The intent of both policies was to put downward pressure on long-term interest rates. Advocates of these policies said that by lowering long-term interest rates, borrowing costs for households and companies would fall, encouraging them to spend more money. The additional spending would kickstart the economy, creating a positive spiral upwards in which greater demand encouraged companies to produce more and hire more workers, which would in turn lead to even more demand. Critics feared that the policies would debase the U.S. dollar and cause inflation to soar. Well, now the data's come in, and we can judge whether the Fed's policies were a success or failure. Since the goal of both policies was to reduce longer-term interest rates, the obvious place to start looking is longer-term interest rates. Did the policies reduce long-term interest rates? And not just rates on treasuries, but also the interest rates on things that households and companies care about, like mortgages and corporate loans. A good test of this is to run a series of event studies where you examine how interest rates move immediately after the announcement of a policy change. This method enables us to isolate the effects of the policies and minimize the contamination from other events. Many economists have run these event studies, each with a slightly different approach or a slightly different set of data. And to the best of my knowledge, they have all found that the Fed's unconventional policies were successful in reducing long-term interest rates. Here I have a summary chart from a speech given by Stanley Fisher the Vice Chairman of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve. As you can see, each round of quantitative easing has resulted in a significant decline in the 10-year Treasury yield. Many estimates suggest that the impact of all of these rounds of quantitative easing is at least one percentage point fall in the long-term interest rates. Some of these studies go further and show that these unconventional policies did reduce mortgage rates and corporate borrowing costs, the rates that households and companies care about when making their spending decisions. So yes, I can say with confidence that the Fed's decision to stimulate the economy through forward guidance and quantitative easing did lower long-term interest rates relative to what they would have been without the policies. This helped push interest rates on mortgages and corporate loans down to incredibly low levels. These lower rates on mortgages and corporate loans in turn encouraged greater consumer spending and corporate investment because it was cheaper for households and companies to borrow money. This increased spending lowered unemployment and raised GDP relative to what they would have been. In fact, some estimates suggest that at its peak, the unconventional policies reduced the nation's unemployment rate by one and a half percentage points and raised GDP by half a percentage point relative to what they would have been without the policies. I should point out that these estimates are more uncertain because they are based on models that might or might not be accurate depictions of the U.S. economy during the worst recession since the Great Depression. With the benefit of hindsight, we can also assess whether the critics' fears came to pass. 
Remember, two of the critics' biggest complaints about the Fed's unconventional actions were that quantitative easing would lead to a debased dollar and soaring inflation. On the first count, the critics were right. The U.S. dollar did weaken because of the Fed's policies. But the weakening of the dollar wasn't a bug of the policies, but rather a feature. When the dollar weakens, the U.S. sells more to other countries because our products have become cheaper, and the U.S. buys less from other countries because their products have become more expensive. The rising net exports creates additional demand for U.S.-made products and increases U.S. employment. So while they were right in their forecast, the critics were thinking more about politics than economics. On the second count, the critics were wrong. Inflation did not take off as a result of quantitative easing. As evidence, inflation has remained below 2% for the better part of the next decade. So, to sum up, the evidence suggests that the unconventional policies had the impact envisioned by the advocates and not as feared by the critics. Now this brings up an interesting question. How is it possible for the Fed to have created trillions of dollars since 2006 and yet prices didn't soar? This seems to go against a commonly held belief that when the Fed prints more money, inflation naturally follows. To describe why inflation remained low despite all of this money printing, let's look at a graph of the money supply over time. Here, I've plotted the monetary base, which is a measure of the amount of dollars in circulation and bank reserves. As you can see, the monetary base grew at a slow rate up until the crisis. Then, when the Fed engaged in quantitative easing, there was an unprecedented surge in the size of the monetary base. But this surge didn't spark inflation because the additional dollars never made it out into the real economy. Specifically, when the Fed purchased trillions of dollars of treasuries and mortgage-backed securities from the banks, the Fed paid the banks in the form of additional reserves held at the Fed. In a healthy economy, the banks would then take this money out of reserves and use it to increase their lending. However, the economy during the Great Recession was so depressed that the banks chose to keep their money in reserves at the Fed. This can be seen when I add the amount of excess reserves to our original graph. Notice that before the Great Recession, banks held almost no excess reserves. If the banks had any additional money, it wasn't parked at the Fed doing nothing. It was out circulating in the economy, being used to build houses and factories and grow the economy. But once the Great Recession hit, this incentive changed. When the Fed bought assets from the banks and gave them reserves, the banks didn't lend it. They just kept the additional money sitting at the Fed. Since this money never left the Federal Reserve's vaults, it never had the chance to cause inflation. This logic brings up one final worry. While inflation has remained low over the past decade or so because the economy has struggled, what will happen when the U.S. economy begins to enjoy strong growth and banks take their money out of the Fed and start to lend it out again? Wouldn't this raise inflation? The answer is that if inflation ever becomes a worry, the Fed will raise rates or begin to sell its treasuries back to the banks, preventing a rush of money into the economy. This process, in fact, started in December 2015, when the Fed raised rates for the first time in seven years. While the Fed might struggle to lower interest rates during times of deep recession, the Federal Reserve faces no technical barrier to raising rates. Because of this, even after the U.S. economy fully recovers and GDP growth spikes, the Fed can always prevent inflation with sufficiently aggressive increases in the federal funds rate. To end this episode, I'll let the former chairman of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, discuss the impact that the Fed's policies had on helping the U.S. economy recover from the Great Recession. In the current economic environment, the benefits of asset purchases and of policy accommodation more generally are clear. Monetary policy is providing important support to the recovery while keeping inflation close to the FOMC's 2% objective. Notably, keeping longer-term interest rates low has helped spark recovery in the housing market and led to increased sales and production of automobiles and other durable goods. Thanks for watching.